Hi everyone, wherever and whenever you are joining us from, welcome to another Fireside Chat. I am here with Mudita, who is the Senior Director of Product at PayPal. Mudita, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Ellen. Great to be here. So we were chatting a little bit backstage um, and I think we're going to have a really amazing chat. We've got so much to talk about already. You're all very unlucky that you missed the backstage chat because it was fascinating. Um, but let's get started with learning a bit more about your personal story. Can you tell us how you got to where you are today and how you got started in tech? Uh, absolutely, yes. So it's been a little bit of a winding journey for me. Uh, I was one of those, uh, you know, uh, I guess people who didn't really know what I wanted to do when I uh, grew up and was excited about all things tech. Uh, I started my journey as a developer and realized that I wasn't a very, very good developer, but loved all aspects of creating and developing, uh, you know, a problem out. Uh, I subsequently became a management consultant after doing a stint in development uh, and working with some really brilliant engineers uh, and enjoyed that quite a bit. Back when I started my management consulting career, uh, there used to be this concept of uh, implementing large uh, enterprise level software. Uh, and that was the first foray, I would say, into product management, where you really learn how to gather requirements, understand and listen to your customer, uh, do a lot of deep thinking and writing and developing that type of good behavior. And then uh, working with a cross-functional team, with your clients as well as yourself, in order to implement uh, a product. Uh, so that was where I started uh, understanding that I enjoy uh, the aspect of deep solutioning, understanding a problem in depth, talking to people, working with different minds to come towards a solution together. Uh, but also realized that my heart was aching for some fulfilling, meaningful work, not like my uh, consulting practice work wasn't uh, meaningful. But I really love the idea of uh, the private sector and the public sector joining hands and building solutions that could really scale. Um, so I know one of the things that uh, deeply sort of thrilled me is, hey, you take a problem, but if you're able to implement it at scale, uh, the the opportunity to service many people is, is really exciting and really fulfilling. And I think the public sector gives you that aspect and the, and the fuel that private sector innovation provides can be just a phenomenal uh, sort of uh, experience. I had a great opportunity uh, to then work with the, uh, uh, the county of Los Angeles, uh, worked in um, the DC area quite a bit as well, uh, worked in uh, uh, Fresno County, worked in Honolulu, Hawaii. So I was very blessed in traveling to different parts of the country and really servicing our government sector quite a bit, uh, but then took a break because uh, I needed more time to think about what life would be next. Um, went back to school for my grad school education and actually got trained as an epidemiologist and a biostatistician and in public policy. So very different from what the work I actually do. So it could be, uh, I guess the biggest learning is you can find many ways into product is what, what I think I'm getting at. And then ultimately, you know, did a lot of work uh, as a program manager for the Gates Foundation, also worked at the World Bank uh, projects uh, or for the World Bank projects quite a bit and really understood the importance of financial technologies and how they can empower people on at the grassroots level and paypal really sits um in the in the middle of this problem and trying to solve this problem but there are many other uh you know excellent companies and thought leaders thinking about the same kind of problem as well so uh that's how i found my road through many uh types of trainings uh into the product role and enjoy it greatly because i'm able to take a little bit from all of those experiences and now work towards building a product that can be scalable, can be something that is delightful, something that really makes an impact impact on the lives of people. And uh, that's how my product journey has been. That's such a varied background. I mean, I've heard a lot of things in people's backgrounds when they come to product, like as you say, all winding paths eventually lead to product somehow. Uh, but I've not heard epidemiology. That's a new one for us, <laughs> definitely. Such a unique experience. Um, so now that you're a senior director of product, um, it's it's always difficult to sort of describe yourself as your job title in products because, you know, they mean different things across different companies, even within the same company, two different directors of product can be doing very different things. What does your kind of day to day or week to week look like at that level? It's a good question. Actually, I would say that one thing that we learned during our um 
consulting days. I think that uh, way of thinking about product potentially still holds true, and I'll share that, and, and let's see if the audience resonates with this. So we think about a problem space in three ways. One is people, one is process, one is tech. And that's an oversimplification, obviously, of, of the problem. But as a director or even as a product manager, I would say, you're always trying to move these three levers when you're working. You're thinking about the people that you work with, whether they are your team or extended team. You're thinking about the processes to unblock them and to simplify execution of product, building the product, bringing it to market. And then the third piece is obviously innovative te technological solutions. Uh, I think the rigor and the discipline, the focus behaviors are things that we need to champion in order to make a product. And a lot of my time is spent uh, really thinking about how do I introduce uh, you know, good behaviors in our team and really um, celebrate the excellent success that naturally comes when you hire brilliant minds and just unlock their potential. So my job as, as, a, as a number one thing that I do is to really step out of the way and not, not get in the way of my team and really accelerate them. And then also as I am getting out of the way, uh, understanding from them through a continuous communication, where are the friction points that they see in their own day-to-day -day execution? Uh, so a lot of time is really spent on the people management aspects of my job and um, uh, and really nourishing and taking care of, the, of, of my team and then our extended team uh, by, by default. And then, uh, of course, figuring out the processes we need to put in place in order to make sure product delivery is a well-oiled machine. And there's always an opportunity to do better and better and better. And especially when you work for companies that are a little bit more mature or have done things a certain way, how do you then challenge the status quo without fracturing the system and still accelerating the team? So I think about that a lot. I think a lot of my time goes in strategic planning, strategic initiatives to obviously uh, you know, bring the business along and really then making sure that we are aligned to the strategic priorities and not doing work that doesn't make sense for the overall growth uh, of, the, of the team or the company. And then obviously measuring our growth and our contribution to business is the third angle that I think about and work on constantly. So a little bit nebulous, happy to go deeper into any of these um, uh, areas if you'd like. Mm -hmm. And as a, obviously at PayPal, you're, um, you're in the fintech industry. Are there any kind of unique challenges to being in the fintech industry that you might not see in other spaces? Absolutely. I think you are, you are in, a, in a very unique position as PayPal, or we are in a very unique position, I should say, as PayPal, because you know, people trust you with their financial well-being in many ways. So regulation. Uh, you know, adhering to sort of the compliance framework is the number one, um, uh, you know, commitment, obviously, to business. And then just taking care of, of, of your customers, whether they're merchants or they're um, consumers. And PayPal is very blessed in that we have a multiple sided network. So uh, on one side, we have our merchants, uh, over 300 million. Uh, we have uh consumers on the other uh, hand who uh, log into PayPal to transact. And then, of course, the third area that I'm extremely passionate about um, and my, com uh, my team leads is the developer segment. Uh, essentially, how do you take developers who use the APIs and SDKs that PayPal builds and really sort of puts together payment solutions uh, beyond payment solutions even for our merchants? to go ahead and accelerate sort of, you know, uh, the online presence or their e-commerce offerings. So I think of it as a three-sided network for us that we are constantly responsible for, but it is rooted in the idea that um, financial empowerment is extremely important for folks, um, regardless of their strata or socioeconomic uh, condition, but especially for the vulnerable populations and doing right by them is something that is a huge mission uh, for PayPal. And often we talk about democratizing financial services. So always thinking about how do we reduce the friction for people who are consuming these services and how we can do better as a company each day in order to service our, um, uh, our base, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can just hear the passion in your voice as you're talking about it. It's obvious this is something like it's a problem that you're obviously very obsessed with, which is obviously a great thing for product people. Um, so we I mean, we, this is something we touched on before we went live about being a woman in tech, a woman in product. 
Um, and I'd like to ask you a bit about being a woman in fintech because the this might be completely wrong, um, but the outsider perspective of fintech is that it can be a little bit of a boys club. Is that a, a giant misconception or is there like a nugget of truth in that that you've had to kind of manoeuvre? Uh, I Here's how I'll say it. Um, I will keep uh, all, uh, you know, company brands aside and just look mm -hmm. at the problem in, in itself and its entirety. Uh, just Silicon Valley or just the tech space in general um, has to obviously do better when it, when it comes to being more inclusive and a place that is more inviting for women in general or any underrepresented, underrepresented uh, group in, 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 in particular. Uh, and there are various various ways of looking at that problem. It starts honestly very early in the way our education system is set up, right? And the incentives we put in place. Uh, there are trends that we are seeing obviously changing. If you look at the number of women graduating from colleges uh, with advanced degrees, et cetera, it's, it's rising quite a bit. And that's like, you know, very, very um, um, interesting and exciting for me as a person in tech. And the second thing is, you know, I will be honest, um, Women need men as allies in this conversation. And uh, anytime that allyship breaks, then we are almost working against each other rather than towards a common goal, which is that everybody deserves to have a great working environment where they feel respected, they feel like they have a seat at the table, they have a voice in the system and can really truly bring about change. So the way I see that it is certainly not a, a gender, um, you know, um, friction issue. It's just how do we build those uh, allyship uh, models and, and bring each other along. What my team does in particular and strategies that have worked well is really be mindful about inclusion and diversity from uh, the get-go. Uh, anytime we make a hire into the team, we have an opportunity to put the best foot forward as being an inviting workplace as a place where both women and men have a seat at the table. Uh, but we are specifically talking to women about things that they need. So oftentimes, I'll, I'll just give an example. Um, women with young children may not be at the liberty to travel as much for work. We're in a different COVID space, but imagine a world where travel comes back, let's say, or, or um, business travel comes back. We have to be mindful of that, right? And can we put uh, policies in place where young fathers and mothers potentially don't have to travel? And can you call that out in your job description to make it a little bit more inviting for women? The other thing we did, for example, at within my team is really look for gendered words in our job description. So for example, women don't often respond well to job descriptions that say, hey, you got to be a go-getter. You got to be like, you know, a sh complete shapeshifter. You should be able to transform the company. That's too much to take on for any human being, by the way. It's just bizarre that we, we should even put those types of aggressive re requirements in a job description. The way we, we, we perform well in our jobs is if we're collaborative, if we communicate well, if we're able to bring each other along. And those are words that resonate with men. They resonate with women as well. And so how do we uh, neutralize some of that gendered uh, entry, even with just a job description? And then, of course, setting up hiring panels that are diverse, not just uh, men, but women, people from different types of backgrounds, et cetera. So there's careful thought that goes into hiring within my team itself. And then just, of course, oftentimes making sure that when we're hiring women, they see women leaders and are able to see that, you know, we're putting money where the mouth is, money where the mouth, you know how that saying goes? Yeah, that, that um, one. <laughs> and just this, making sure that, you know, we are being authentic in, in the way we're showing up. And, uh, and, and I, I'm very fortunate, very fortunate here at PayPal and, and many other companies that I've worked for where these conversations are not frowned upon. These are conversations that people embrace. Oftentimes, um, you know, we can lead with examples of good behavior and make that a structural change within the team so that it's not something that you have to talk about. Like inclusion is in, in hiring is not something I have to talk about because that's how I've structured the hiring process. And it's just a process we follow. So uh, that's what I've learned. And then, of course, many other aspects of being a, a woman in tech and fintech. Uh, you know, the spaces uh, for women to own and to lead. And I'm excited about what the future prospect uh, brings us. I'll tell you, there are a couple of companies that I'm extremely excited about in the fintech space 
Uh, and I'll just name one. And I am not an investor in this company. I have no like personal interest, but it's just the way this company showed up was quite exciting. Elevest is um, an interesting company, I think, that is women owned and thinks about the way women invest and speaks to women. There is an immense opportunity also in the market just generally if we're going to be serious about bringing women along is to invest in products and ideas that make sense for women. Um, and I would say, uh, keep Elevist on one side, keep Robin Hood on one side. And, and it's interesting to just see how they both show up. And I think it is um, a fantastic space for everybody to win, but maybe how you shape your messaging and product for the audience, uh, you know, leaders have to think about, and it all depends on the leader on the seat at that point. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So um, I'm dying to dig more into both women in the industry and the fintech industry. Um, so you mentioned about um, the democratization of financial services. How do you see that sort of developing maybe over the next maybe over the next three, four, five years? Because um, obviously, I think I think finance is becoming more and more of a hot topic in the public space before money was just a thing like you have your credit card or your debit card or you have like your wallet. And that was pretty much all we really thought about but now like uh, investments getting the spotlight cryptocurrencies getting the spotlight nfts which i still struggle to understand um <laughs> it's all sort of going on at the moment and it's a really hot topic so as a professional in the space i would love to ask you what you think we'll see from the fintech industry in the next like five years in terms of democratizing these services i'll take a slightly different stab and maybe a, a more nuanced response to this than probably you hear from a lot of the product folks in fintech. See, my career in fintech started with my work at, um, at UCSF, at, um, at the Gates Foundation, at the, with the World Bank Initiative. So my perspective on fintech is very different from uh, what the one percenters or the five percenters of the world uh, thinks. And that is also important but the real financial empowerment or the fintech technology needs to really reach at the bottom of the pyramid. And this is like a poor way of describing it, but the pyramid, let's say, if, if it's like, like, like that, if I can make my uh, hand work, uh, we are kind of solving for this top portion of the world, right? But the problem and the inclusion for fin financial services needs to happen at the bottom of the pyramid to really transform and accelerate uh, the innovation. Crypto has huge like sort of potential for sure. Um, so does um, uh, these non-traditional ways of financing. So I'm very excited about some of the work that <clears throat> non-traditional banking uh, ideas are bringing into into sort of the um, into this into the space. Imagine a world where you needed to have collateral you needed to have a good credit score. You needed to have your parents who could vouch for you, um, uh, for your credit, et cetera. Majority of the world may not work like that. You know, people uh, may not have a perfect credit uh, score or a mechanism even to get into the credit uh, market. So what are the alternative systems that we can build in order to enable these people, right? Uh, buy now, pay later is a classic example of how we shifted already in the market. Uh, that you don't need a huge, um, let's say, credit worthiness in order to buy something that could be an aspirational buy for you. You can split it up in multiple uh, sort of payments, et cetera. So the innovation is happening already, even without us sort of um, uh, trying sometimes. I think COVID did a lot of that. Uh, but I really do envision and hope for a world, as you asked, uh, Ellen, uh, is where we can solve for that bottom of the pyramid customer. If a woman in India is able to, and that's something I'm personally passionate about, is able to go in, uh, use a savings product and build for the future of her daughter, for her education, for her wedding, for her healthcare, that's a win. And that's the end game, honestly. I don't think we'll be able to get there in five years. It may not happen in my lifetime, but that's where the ball needs to be or the eye needs to be. But then definitely all the trends that I'm seeing are very, very exciting. Crypto, especially as you said, NFTs. Yeah, I'm interested to see how that that that's going to show up. I think I'm a little bit old school sometimes where I'm like, oh, how does this apply in for, for scale? Uh, but ultimately, if the core financial services cannot operate for people who need it most, then we keep solving for that top 5%. And that's exciting. But uh, there's a bigger opportunity out there for sure.
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think it really speaks to the need for diversity uh, across the tech industry, but also in fintech that you have people who can maybe more closely empathize with the people at like the bottom of the pyramid, um, people from like the, the countries where that type of customer is more common. Um, so, yeah, it's just a big like big white flag waved for diversity in the industry there. Um, so I see we have some um, audience comments coming in. Lots of people very excited about getting into the fintech industry or transitioning to a product role within the fintech industry. Um, do you have any like little nuggets of advice or wisdom for people who maybe they already work in product but not in fintech and they're looking to transition or people that are coming to this straight out of college and thinking, yeah, fintech is where it's at? Yeah, I'm, I'm so delighted that uh, fintech is suddenly, um, you know, garnering garnering a lot of interest and and uh, universal willing willing it uh, kind of stays like that for 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 a long long time till we've solved all of uh, world's financial problems. Um, I would say that if you are of a curious mind, you are excited about how finance generally works, and you are not offended by the idea of, you know, uh, democratization of money. This is your space. You should be excited about all the tech improvements and acceleration that's happening here. Uh, COVID, again, I'll say was a huge accelerator for the e-commerce space anyways, and payments powers, obviously, a lot of the e-commerce uh, uh, technologies as well. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, if you're interested in fintech, apply, like apply, because fintech, as far as the core payments pieces are concerned, it is a massive space. And if you can touch components of it, even I like now having worked uh, in this space for quite some time, I still feel like I'm just scratching the surface because the technology is just so deep and so wide that I think it'll take lifetimes just to really truly understand all aspects of it. But I think, uh, you know, understanding how the whole credit processing works, how the debit processing works, understanding how money movement works, et cetera. And this is like publicly available information that we can just go ahead and digest. I think Visa puts out great learning materials. PayPal puts out great learning materials. I think a lot of the uh, new sort of um, uh, FinTech players put out like amazing, just uh, free knowledge out there that I think we should just be eating up and reading on a regular basis. But then honestly, just jump in. There is no magic formula to this. Make your way into the industry. Uh, I know that a lot of hiring is happening in this area. It's a great time to actually join as well. Luckily, like the job market is is um, is good for the techies at the moment or, or product folks at the moment. And I would say that it's not just product. Even if you can touch the program aspects, uh, if, even if you can touch the analytics aspects of this work, it is actually great learning and sets you up for success. Uh, as far as uh, honestly, the, the qualifications you need, as long as you have basic understanding about uh, finances in general, uh, as long as you're curious about customer problems, as long as you understand that solving for friction is the biggest value add here, uh, I think uh, you are, you're gunning for the right kind of role in, in fintech. Well, you're almost making me want to transition into fintech now. That was so convincing. I hope my manager's not listening to that. It's not true. It was a joke. It was a joke. Um, so we, we've covered some really important topics here. We've talked about some really important stuff. Uh, so let's, um, we've got another five minutes. Let's maybe transition into some more lighthearted things. Um, if you could go back in time and give yourself any piece of advice to the younger version of you um, for your career, what would that piece of advice be? I, I feel like I, I shouldn't uh, give any advice because I'm learning so much myself. I think there's this is an advice for myself that I um, have been using on a daily basis. Um, I think just compassion for yourself. And I, I, I am, uh, you know, there is a spiritual angle to this as well. Uh, and I'm reading the questions that are coming in from the audience as well. Things are changing so fast so fast in the, in the whole digitization of the economy that is taking place right now is that we literally have to hang on and just write this right. It's a fantastic time to be in, actually. Uh, there is the fear of missing out, of course, but that's where compassion for self comes in. Uh, you know, uh, I remember back in the day when I was working at eBay, um, the CEO had said um, that you're always training for the marathon. You are not training for the sprint. Of course, it's great to sprint, take a breather, recharge, 
and come back, but you're training for the marathon. And I think if we take time as a more uh, uh, longer term flow, then it's easier to deal with personal failures or personal, uh, you know, times where I feel like, oh my goodness, I don't think I'll be able to survive this like shocker into, into, into my life. But I think having compassion for that is key. And then just writing down your achievements on a yearly basis. This is something that uh, I worked with the chief architect uh, at eBay uh, when reporting into him. He said uh, a great practice he did is at the end of every year, he pulled up LinkedIn and wrote down all the great things that he had done. And, uh, it's fascinating because you're writing a little bit of your history uh, and, and, and proudly showing it to the world. Um, but it's such a great way to just look back how far along you came. And it's almost a deliberate exercise. Otherwise, we're just running in this hamster wheel without realizing that, you know, we're making a contribution to our own learning. We are uh, sort of making a contribution to the tech space uh, and, and documenting that is, is sort of the great way. I love the analogy of the marathon because sometimes it can feel like a sprint and a relay race at the same time. So yeah, picturing it as a marathon, that's super valuable. Um, and now as a, as a leader, of course, um, the more, I mean, I know we hate the word authority in product, but the more authority that you gain as you uh, advance in your career, the more things you're able to delegate and get off of your plate and onto other people's so you can focus on the bigger picture. But is there anything that you kind of like to keep for yourself just because you enjoy it? Yeah, I, I before I became a people manager, I also spent a number of years just doing individual contributor or IC work, as, as it's called in the uh, industry a lot of times. Um, and I love doing the deep writing, the structured thinking. Uh, I liked, uh, I used to have my own blog as at some point as well. And, and now that you're calling me, uh, you're kind of, Putting limelight on this, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I haven't kept up with that, so I need to. Uh, so I think deep thinking and writing is something that I truly enjoy and contributing to uh, sort of the strategy pieces is something I enjoy greatly. It's nourishing for my soul. And then um, some things that I have sort of put in practice and feel very proud of is the hiring framework and the hiring practices that I've built for my team. And I cling on to those things like a little spider who just can't give up on their spider web. And I'm so glad that uh, I'm still involved in some of those things, uh, even though I don't need to be, um, but uh, truly enjoy sort of the strategic writing, thinking, as well as the hiring pieces of my job and won't give it up. <laughs> <laughs> just keep spider clinging onto it like no one like they'll pry it from your cold dead hands <laughs> right <laughs> pretty well, well um Mudit, this has been an absolute joy um please come back for another fireside chat as soon as possible i can just tell that we've got loads more to talk about uh, and yeah thank you so much for generously donating your time i hope the audience enjoyed that as much as i did what fun thank you so much for your time and the questions were excellent and hope to come back soon Okay, that's it for today's fireside chat, unfortunately. Uh, but don't worry, you know that we always come back with another one. So we'll see you in the next fireside chat. Bye.